Hi, welcome to EEV blog number 1024. And yes, you should know the significance of 1024. Some rated it much more important than the 1000th video. So I thought I'd do something 1K related. One, not 1K, as in 1000, 1024. Um, two to the power of 10. We have to go back to the future here, August 1999. I thought you, I'd show you an old project I had published. Let's go to page 60, shall we? Ta-da! Oh no, that's the... <laughs> Sorry, this was actually very confusing. There are two v projects in this issue. One is mine and the other is someone else's uh, one, by the way. James uh, Barker is a pseudonym for uh, someone who I won't tell you who, but that's not their real name. Anyway, it's a video title generator. Here's mine. Here's a name you might recognize, David L. Jones. And this was a project, a um, little project that I used to sell in both kit and uh, built up form, it was actually very popular at the time, it inserted uh, a time date over composite video signals, which was a big deal back in 1999 for security and other um, applications. Anyway, uh, well, I won't go through the whole article, I'll actually scan it in and include it down below, below for those who want to read the whole thing. But it basically used a PIC 16F84 inside here, and here's the entire schematic. It used a special um, ST, STV5730A uh, video text generator chip, so the PIC 16F84 wasn't actually doing any of the uh, titling and stuff like that, it just basically uh, controlled this via the uh, serial interface, but this 16F84, not to be confused with the modern 16F84A, that actually uh, contained one program, 1K program words of memory, 1,024, uh, not bytes, because the PIC uh, processors are actually 14-bit uh, instruction words, so it's like 1.8 K, but it's actually uh, really 1,024 program words, 1K. So I thought we'd take a look at this old project and see if we can compile it again. And there's the one-to-one -one PCB pattern for those who want to build their own at home, although you'll have to scale this video properly. But you could do it, kind of. And there's my original uh, prototype, which I sent in, which, ta-da, I found in the archives there. There it is. That is... Uh, yeah, it's even got the same label. Look at that, <laughs> same original label on it. So they sent, um, they did send the uh, the prototype projects back. These magazines, but you had to uh, send it to them to uh, so that they could test it out before they and vet it before they publish the thing. Anyway, composite video in, composite video out, powered from uh, 12 volts DC, a little 5 volt regulator in there. PIC 16F84, uh, Dallas Semiconductor DS1307, uh, real time clock chip, uh, the main crystal and the uh, 32 kilohertz. Uh, crystal for the real-time clock. I bit banged, as I'll show you in the source code, bit banged an I squared C uh, serial uh, I squared C port on this thing, and all this uh, wonderful stuff with the time date overlay, everything ran in one k of program memory, just. But that's not all. Two months later, in October 1999, I had another one published, a follow-up. Uh, project, which was the v VTG, as opposed to the VCG, was the video title generator. Where is it? There it is. Ta-da! Very similar uh, case to this one, except it hooked up to a PC-80 keyboard, none of this, uh, you know, modern USB or PS2 rubbish, um, and it allowed you to insert, it basically used the same PIC 16 f 84 processor, but it uh, allowed you to put video titles, uh, text, so you could actually move the cursor around the screen, you could type in any text you actually wanted, and this is like the menu interface on it, so this did a lot more stuff than that uh, time date one, but this one also fitted in 1K of program memory, and you could actually uh, do bigger fonts and stuff like that um, as well, so it was quite jazzy. So let's take a look at the source code and see if we can compile it. And by the way, when I had the first one uh, there published in August, that was the very last editorial, the very last time that uh, the famous uh, Jim Rowe actually um, edited the magazine, and he said, nope, I'm handing over to uh, Graham Cattley, and 
Well, it lasted a couple of more months as Electronics Australia before it became EA. Well, they still had Electronics Australia, but it became EA and Gadget Mania. And that was the beginning of the end. And like nine months after that, they renamed it EAT. Um, or EA Today, they dropped the Electronics Australia title and everyone unsubscribed, literally everyone unsubscribed from the magazine and they folded like two or three issues later or uh, something like that. And But basically, that was the end, April 2000, um, let's say the end of 1999 when I had these projects published was the end of the venerable Electronics Australia as we knew it and it had lasted for, well, if you believe Jim, Oh, there you go. And you should, because he's right. 77 years it was going for at that point. Absolutely, under various names, radio, TV, and hobbies, and then Wireless Weekly. Anyway, a bit of nostalgia for those Aussies. All right, I thought it'd be interesting to see if I could still compile my original assembler source code 18 years later, after the fact. Is it still possible? Because um, here it is. I've got the original source files version 1. That's how I labeled them. VCG Video Character Generator 1.0. Looks like I jumped from 1.0 to 2.0. I can't remember the differences. 2.0a, 2.0b. Uh, 2.1 seems to be the latest. Now, I do remember that 2.1a is the version for a PIC 16C61 chip, not the F. So I think I used that in production because that chip was cheaper. The CMOS version, the one-time programmable CMOS version was cheaper than the uh, Flash program. I only used the F84 uh, for um, software development, I think. I think the, one, the ones I actually shipped were the C versions because um, I, I didn't include an in-serial programming header on there because it wasn't like it wasn't easy to program these things back then right so uh you know it's not like you have your pick kits and all sorts of stuff you do these days here's all my original assembler code there it is that's got a lot of comments on there yay me um if, <laughs> look at that it's quite comprehensive so i, I just want to cut and paste this code into the new MP Lab environment or, or whatever it is and see if we can use it. Now, um, I don't think I've used MP Lab X <coughs> integrator, but I've downloaded this and it's 667 megabytes. I've downloaded it, installed it, and yeah, it's shocking. Is that, or is that, yeah, I assume that's the one you can, I presume you can just download the command line assembler if that's what you want to do. But I'm just going to go for broke and install MP Lab X IDE, see if they still support the chip and still support just compiling it straight out of the box 18 years later. Let's go. All right, here's the MP Lab X IDE. I'm not an expert on using this, um, so uh, please forgive me uh, dicking around and whatnot. But let's uh, go in and let's create a new project. Standalone project is what we want. Yep, no worries. We don't want any of that rubbish so we want um i believe they're a mid-range pick they have different ranges so if you go into the baseline ones they're they're i think they've got yeah your tiny ones your 10 12 oh no 16c no it doesn't it see it doesn't even have the 16c61 which i originally uh used so let's go into them and it certainly doesn't have the f84 in there ta-da 84 we have the 84 and the original 84, not just the new 16F84A, which is just like, I think they just use like a new manufacturing process or whatever, but they still, so there might be very minor differences uh, programming wise, I'm not sure. But mine was the original 16F84 and they still support it. And this is one of the good things about microchip, hats off to them. They do support legacy products really well. So we'll choose the original 16F84 Next, and we can choose our hardware tools, um, ICD, what other, microchip starter kits, we can choose, I don't know what I'm going to try and program it with yet, I got no, probably pick chip, but I don't have the ISP on there, I'd have to bodge something up, but we can just choose the simulator, so let's just choose the simulator for now, we can always change it later, and here we go, we don't want to use the PIC-C compiler, no, that rubbish, this is what we want, so we're going to choose the assembler, and uh, VC, we'll just call it VCG, shall we? Set as main project, boom, encoding, don't care about that. We'll just go, and we're in like Flynn. There's our device, the 16F84. 
Okay, so what we want to do is new assembly file, ASM. So I won't find the original file. I'll just get a new one. I'll just make a new one in the project directory. And here we go, vcg.asm. There it is. And now I can just uh, cut and paste in my code. Okay, so I've just highlighted uh, all my code there from the text file. We'll copy that and we'll paste it. Bingo, we're in like Flynn. We've got this newfangled color syntax highlighting, which uh, makes it look a lot better. Look, it knows its comments, so they're all green. It knows the defines and it knows the um, variables and all that uh, sort of jazz. So that is quite nice. And uh, there's all my assembler code. So we can uh, save that and let's try and compile it. One thing I really like is this navigator. Look, look at this, VCG ASM navigator, and this has it's pulled in all my variables and whatnot, so we can go like cursor loop. We can jump to my function in there for cursor loop. Look at that. Isn't that great? Stable, whatever that means. Um, oh, I squared C. There's my I squared C bus uh, stable condition. So here we go. Here's all the I squared C routines. So I wrote my own uh, bit banging I squared C uh, routine for this because the 16F84 does not have an I squared C uh, hardware in it. There we go. So I'm using the trace instruction to set the bits and I squared C start condition and then send byte. So there's my routine for pass byte to the send buff reg. I like, I don't know, I've forgotten like almost all of this. Um, I used to be pretty good at uh, microchip assembler code, but now it's like, it's almost cling on to me now. Ah. Well, it's 18 years ago. Give me a break. Yeah, not long after this, I sort of like switched to C and like I never really touched uh, much assembler after that. It was, you know, only very occasional things that I needed to do. So yeah, I've uh, forgotten more than I've remembered, unfortunately. But of course, it wouldn't take me long to uh, pick up all this again and get back up to speed. You know, it's just a matter of hours. Like it's not you know, we days or weeks or anything like that. So anyway, so we've got our VCG ASM. So what I want to do is now I just want to build it. Clean build and main project. Let's just hit the button. See if it works. Uh, we've selected 16, we've selected our part, the 16F84. We've included our source code. We've only got the one ASM file. No, no, we don't have to link anything in. We don't have to do anything. This should work. Fingers crossed, 18 years later. Come on, microchip. Don't let us down. Woo! Build successful. <laughs> Total time, one second. There you go. Done. Uh, VCG, it's generated. There we go. It's generated vcgxproduction.hex. It's generated our hex file. There's the command line. And that it used slash q slash 16f84 build production, blah, 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 blah. And VCG ASM was our only uh, file. Now, it gave us a couple of messages, uh, line 78, register in operam, not in bank zero, ensure that bank bits are correct, I don't remember all this, yeah, the memory architecture of the uh, baseline picks is like, you have to swap banks and stuff like that, if I remember rightly, so if we go up the top, we'll probably find that I mention... I do banks. Uh, here we go. So the originate zero, so it actually starts at address zero, and yep, select bank one. There it is. There we go. So I'm selecting memory bank one. I don't select, and then I do something else and select bank zero. I, I can't remember the architecture off the top of my head. Um, it'll take me a while to get back up to speed on that. But yeah, um, so that's a re register in opera and not in banks. I don't know if that was a regular if I got that message back then and it's just something I ignored or uh, whatnot. Like it's not an error, so it's like just, just a message. I guess it's just ensure that the bank bits are correct. I'm sure I got it right. I knew what I was doing right in the assembler code. So it's not an error, it compiled. 18 years later, with the big MP Lab X environment, all 690 whatever meg of it, and it just, it simply worked. My co it's generated the production hex file. So if we go up here, distribution, there we go. Distribution, default, production, there's our hex file. That's our hex file, which we can program into our 16F84 using whatever programmer you like. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. All right, so the whole point of this video was also to see how much memory I had left um, I was using. So if we go into memory down here, dashboard usage symbols, 
Oh, hey, what I think I'll do is I'll just go in here and debug main project and see what... Aha! There it is. There it is. Win a win a chicken dinner. Data, I've got zero bytes free. Oh, data used zero, free 68. Yeah, I didn't use any um, data, um, like IE SRAM. And there you go. I've used 95%. Uh, I've got, I used 974 program words um, and I got 50 free. So I don't have much left out of all this source code. Um, I'm not sure if I went, like if early versions were, you know, worse and I went through an optimizer. I do recall kind of doing that, thinking that I do remember being right on the edge of the 1K, like 50, ah, oh, it's heaps, you know, 50 free. I probably went through and optimized it a bit, trying to get it down, just so that further on, when I was actually uh, selling this product, I could like add the odd feature or tweak a, a few things and stuff like that. You know, you don't want to be shipping with a thousand and, you know, using every single last program word in your actual processor, because then you can't fix bugs and insert maybe a little tiny feature or whatnot. So yeah, having 50 bytes free, you know, that just gives you some flexibility to uh, fix some stuff. But there you go, I used almost all of my 1K and it compiled. Ah, oh, fantastic. Okay, what I've done now is I've taken my other project, the VTG, the video title generator, which used the uh, uh, AT keyboard to uh, uh, type characters in and do video overlay, and I've included that. So I've created a project for that, and here's my VTD, VTG source code. Use the same PIX16F84. There it is there. And uh, it also was, if memory serves me correctly, very close to the one K. Oh, I've got some lookup tables there. There you go. Lookup table. Convert keyboard codes into STV5730 display codes. There you go. So I put that at a specific address in memory right at the end. All right. You've got to right click on here and set that one as main project. Um, if you've got multiple projects in here. So we should just be able to compile that. Ta-da! Build successful! Of course it did the other one. It looks like we've got the same bank error messages here. Uh, but there's no errors. There's no errors. It has generated VTG uh, production dot hex. Fantastic. And what I want to do now is actually go in and have a look at, where is it, Windows? Uh, debugging? No. Pick memory views. I want to go in and actually view the program memory. And here we go. So let's let's have a look at the program memory. And because this is assembler, you've got to remember this, right? I'm telling this processor what to do, instruction by instruction. So the code that I've typed up here should match what's the disassembled code down in here. So if you look at address zero here, I've, um, I originate my code at address zero. That's what originate zero there means. Start, it's the, it's the processor reset vector, the start of code. Um, just in the, in the picks, it's uh, zero. And my first instruction is clear F port B. And sure enough, down here is clear F port B. It's compiled it, and then we're looking at that, uh, like the simulated memory there, and it's decompiling it, and it's exactly the same. BC it, look, you'll see it just matches every single instruction. It's like, and if we go right to the end, can we go right to the end? Here we go, 1024. Ah, uh, let's go to our lookup table. That all looks the same. Ha ha. Our last one there is 7A. So if we go right to the bottom of my code, this is interesting. Uh, 7A, there it is. OX7A, that was the very last line of my code, but I actually did include, so that matches, by the way, OX7A matches that, 5F, everything is, you know, byte for byte, word for word, um, instruction for instruction, exactly what I wrote in my assembler code, because that's the whole point of assembler. Why I've put all these extra spaces in here, I think I, for some reason, I decided that I should just fill the rest of the memory, because that was a that was a table that I looked up to do the instructions and I just thought, well, I'm not using the rest of that memory. So, uh, you know, I might as well fill it with 
something that I know is going to be a space, right? So it, like, yeah, there there was some uh, there was there was some program reason why I actually just filled the rest of the processor memory with that. But of course, if I wanted to add extra space, um, if I wanted to use extra instructions, I could have just changed that originate instruction 300 to closer to where I was at the end of memory, and I could tweak it just to the last byte there. Yes, they're the keyboard code lookups. That's right. It converts the keyboard code into the display code. Aha! Here's another lookup table which was my, this is what I'm looking for, OX, I specifically put that into uh, address 210 hex there, and this has all of my menu items. So if you had a looked over here, my menus, there you go, this is what it, my title generator looks like, you know, VTG01, so all, all that text has to be stored in the program memory somewhere, and I put that in this table here. So there you go, it matches VTG01, version 2.1, etc., copyright 99, and then F1, all the instructions to tell the user what to actually do. And they were all in that lookup table there. So I had to expend all of my precious, like a good part of my precious 1K program memory, putting in all these strings. I mean, you know, the more strings you have, the more of that 1k that you're chewing up. You've got to store them in there. There are ways to compress and do other stuff if you're really desperate. And for those playing along at home who want to know how many bytes I had left over on the video title generator, I used 930. So not as many as the, I don't, yeah, I used like 970 um, in the video character generator. So I've got 94 program words free. You fly to the freaking moon on 94 program words. Right, I think I'll go edit this now, because I'm shooting the video out of sequence. Video cue the radio star. I heard you on the wireless back in 52. Video cue the radio star. So, does it actually still work after all this time? Well, there's only one way to find out, that's to plug it up. I've got this uh, O1 XDS3202, which actually has a composite video output and sure enough you turn on the power and there it is on the external screen no worries at all but there's no title text um so that means that the STM chip on here must be working it's processing the surface mount one under there it's processing the video but we're getting no overlay whatsoever the menu buttons do absolutely Nothing. So I think that might be a difference. This might oscilloscope might be generating NTSC, and I think I had the flag set in here for well for the Australian PAL version. So let's try a known PAL video source. This Alunya. Um, it's actually an Australian uh, video generator, quite old, but you know still works. So let's plug it in. Handily, we've got a. Ta-da! It works! Look at that! Beautiful! And that is gorgeous video. Yes, I'm actually generating a black signal. So I'm generating a power so I can go... Oh, hang on. There we go. Checkerboard. Ah, uh, that's black. There we go. We've got crosshatch. Uh, whatever that is. Um, yep. Also, well, that doesn't work too well. There you go, the old uh, monochrome color bars. We can switch those to color, and there you go. We get a bit of shimmering on there, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I can adjust the burst level on this, for example. So that's just all, yeah. So I don't know. Whatever. Looks beautiful. Look at that. Oh, look at the funky stuff I can do. Sorry, I'm just playing. <laughs> just having a bit of fun with some uh, modes on this puppy. Neat. Okay, so what we could do is we could actually go in there and adjust the time and date and also this title. Um, so we stored a bit of text. If you just press, yeah, if you just press mode button. Oh, I don't know why I did that, but you can go in there and you can just increment all this stuff. Go across, you can increment your date. Sweet as. But there you go, you could go in there and set just a short uh, title text. Now I could actually program this with my uh, Pit Kit 3, of course, but hey, I've already got this little mini pro uh, program you've seen in a previous video, and it does uh, picks and it does the 16F84. So I've loaded that file in, let's give it a bell. 
Program. Yep. Program. Jeez, it's pretty slow for 1K. <laughs> wow. Two of your thumbs. Says it's done. All right, were we able to program this brand spanking new Pick 16 F84? The pins weren't even bent on this puppy. So only one way to find out. Let's power it up and see if everything worked after 18 years. Here we go. Woo! You <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering where I actually stored this uh, text up here, because the uh, PIC 16 F84 doesn't have any built-in E squared prom and you couldn't rewrite its own program memory that I recall anyway. Um, so I actually stored it in the Dallas Semiconductor DS1307 chip. It actually had like, you know, 50 or 128 bytes or something um, of memory in there, of SRAM memory, and that was battery back down there with the same battery that ran the real-time clock. So over the I squared C, I just stored that video text in there. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that look down memory lane of what uh, it is capable, a pretty primitive example of what's capable inside a 1K of program memory. It'd actually be an interesting experiment to actually try to see if we could get a, uh, in this case, any of the microchip RC compilers to do that exact same code in 1K. You probably could. The modern RC compilers are very, very good if you're optimizing for code space and stuff like that. But back when I did this, I don't think there was any real, even like using the best one at the time, which was like the Australian high-tech C compiler, which microchip eventually bought. I don't even think that could do it back in the day, because I think I had had it and I just went nah you know and uh, you paid a lot for the 2k chip versus the 1k chip it was like double the cost or something you know and um so it added to the cost of the kit and things like that so I sold that little kit until uh they ST discontinued like two three years later or something the the uh chip in there and there really wasn't anything else in the industry that could just take video in video out and then some sort of digital serial interface to do video text overlay. I know there are these days, but back then, this was the only chip on the market that I was aware of that actually did this. And it was a real bummer. There were a lot of people using this chip and a lot of people upset when they discontinued the thing. Anyway, if you like that video, please give it a big thumbs up because that always helps a lot. And leave your stories down below in the comments or on the EV blog forum about if you've uh, done some magic in 1K of program memory. Uh, we've talked about it in the amp hour before actually doing a contest, like the 1K programming contest, because it's just like, you know, a nice round, small value that just lets you appreciate, you know, assembly language uh, programming and trying to extract the maximum possible stuff from 1K of memory. I know this is a fairly primitive example, but you know, it doesn't do a hell of a lot, but I was, you know, pretty impressed that I managed to fit that in uh, 1K of assembly code without trying too hard anyway. So yeah, leave your stories down below or even better yet, link to a project if you've done something really cool in 1K of memory. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, 1024th video. I hope I did something appropriate. Catch you next time.